More history for Albert Pujols last night as the Cardinals stomped the Reds in Cincinnati, and I was there to witness it. Tyler O'Neill starting to heat up as he supplanted Dylan Carlson as the starting center fielder. And we've got the latest on starting pitcher Jack Flaherty all on today's episode of Locked on Cardinals. You are Locked on Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Cardinals fans. I'm J.D. Haffer, and I'm a national radio sports anchor, born and raised in the Lou, a lifetime Cardinals fan, and I am your host for Locked on Cardinals, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, covering your team every day. You can follow me on Twitter at J.D. Sports Radio. Follow the podcast at LO underscore Cardinals. I want to thank those of you who make Locked on Cardinals your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts. You can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Available on YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe and comment so you can interact with us. This is a show serving Cardinal Nation and giving the best fans in baseball all of the info about the birds on the bat. Well, it was a wet and rainy afternoon in Cincinnati yesterday, so the game time pushed back about an hour and a half from its original, but that did not slow the Cardinals down one bit. They brought the lightning and the thunder to go with the rain in their bats to Great American Ballpark on Monday night. The pitching matchup, you had the all-star, Miles Michaelis, taking on 34-year-old Chase Anderson, who had just been signed over the weekend from the Tampa Bay Rays AAA affiliate to start the game. Now, neither team does anything in the first. In fact, Chase Anderson strikes out Newbar and Paul Goldschmidt. So he was clearly pumped up to be back in the show. And who can blame him? I mean, think about this for a minute. Chase Anderson, he's toiling away. He's stuck in AAA purgatory after spending eight years in the major leagues. And now he gets to face the NL Central Division leading Cardinals who feature the likely NL MVP and Paul Goldschmidt, perennial all-star and gold glover Nolan Arenado. You've got Albert Pujols, the living legend and future Hall of Famer, making a charge towards 700 home runs in the lineup as well. I mean, if this doesn't get you hyped to play the game of baseball, I don't know what will. So his juices were flowing there flowing there in the first inning, but things were a bit different in the second inning. Tyler O'Neill steps up to the plate with one out. And as I mentioned yesterday, he's really starting to turn it on as we wrap up the month of August. He catches a Chase Anderson sinker up in the zone, and he unloads on it. Exit Velo, 108.1. It lands 423 feet away in the second-tier deck of the bleachers to give the Cardinals a one nothing lead. It's Bro Neal's 11th of the season, and that makes back-to-back jacks for Tyler after the three-run dinger that he hit on Sunday night to beat the Braves. So very excited about that, obviously. Got to show off the Tyler Bro Neal towel in situations like this because I love him. And uh, that shot kind of snaps Chase Anderson back to reality in a way. He's like, oh, boy, this is real now. These guys can swing it. And here comes Albert. Now, I'm at this game last night, and – um To say the crowd was sparse is putting it lightly. I'm sure you noticed on TV that not a lot of fans in the seats at GABP. Now, I'm a little shocked that in a supposed baseball town like Cincinnati, that more fans didn't come out just to see if Albert does something special as he continues rewriting the record books this season. Now, the Cardinals side of the stands, decently busy, but a very empty ballpark last night, which I got to admit was a little disappointing. I mean, I get that it, it was a Monday night and the weather was sucky. And the Reds are not good. And school is back in session. But still, a little disappointed because this is history, man. This is Albert Pujols going for 700. I mean, why wouldn't you want to see that as a baseball fan? So, anywho, I'm sitting behind home plate in the scout seat surrounded by Cardinals fans. And one of my favorite things to do at the ballpark is I love seeing the different jerseys that fans wear to games. I I just It blows me away some of the names you'll see. You'll get the usual suspects like Goldie. Arenado, Yachty, Pujols. You'll see some holidays, Edmonds, Scott Rowland, even older ones. You'll get you'll see some people walking around in like a Stan the Man Musial one, Bob Gibson, some Willie McGee jerseys. Those are those are pretty normal. Last night, I'm rocking a powder blue Ozzy Smith last night at the ball game. But the guy in front of me, holy crap, had a powder blue Bob Horner Cardinals jersey on. I couldn't believe it. For those unfamiliar, Bob Horner. Number one overall pick by the Atlanta Braves out of Arizona State in 1978. Had a really good career in Atlanta. And he's one of the few guys that I know of that actually went straight from the college ranks 
and then went straight to the pros. When he got drafted, he never actually played a game in the minor leagues. He, he went straight into the Atlanta Braves lineup, uh, won the Rookie of the Year award over Ozzy Smith, who was with the Padres at that point in his career. Um, but his final year in the major leagues, that was 1988. And uh, that year, he became a St. Louis Cardinal. He played in just 60 games, hit a total of three home runs. Three before he hurt his shoulder and ended his season and ultimately his career at the age of 30, he was out. And this dude in front of me was wearing the Cardinals jersey of Bob Horner at the game in Cincinnati on August 29, 2022. It was, uh, it was unreal. He was a good guy. We had some older Cardinal fans to my left. We had a bunch down here to my right. Just Cardinal fans all over the ballpark last night, filling up the seats. So uh, back to the game. Cards are up one nothing. Albert comes up and 95% of the Cardinals fans stand up. They applaud him. We all get our phones out because we want to record history. That's what we're trying to do. No home run this time for Pujols. He singles, though, which is pretty much the beginning of the end for Chase Anderson's night. Dickerson singles. Kisner walks. Base is loaded. Edmund slaps one to right field for a double. It's 3 to nothing, Cardinals, and that's it for Anderson. He gets yanked one and one-third. They bring in the lefty, Ross Detweiler, and we know how the Cardinals love to hit against some lefties, man. They feast on these guys. So new bar singles, 4 to nothing, goes to second on an errant throw. Some really smart base running. And like I said yesterday in the preview of the series, if you do the little things right against these kind of teams who aren't very good, it will normally pay off in the end. Next hitter is going to be Brendan Donovan. He singles, and that plates two because Newbar had taken that extra base at second. Six nothing Cardinals, which closes the book on Anderson. Again, one and one third, five runs, four hits. His ERA, 33.75. Welcome back to the show, Chase Anderson. So starting with O'Neill's home run, here's what you got. You got the homer. You got a single, single, walk, double, single, single. That is so miserable for an opposing team. Like, home runs are cool, and I know we dig them, and chicks dig the long, but I get all of that. But when you have a carousel of runners continuously circling, circling the bases, like, it's torture. It is torture to the other team. And there's more to come. We're going to get to Albert's historic moment next on Locked on Cardinals because uh, I really want to, you know, Point that one out because it's a big deal to me. But first, as you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders, right? LinkedIn Jobs, that's here to make it easier to find the people that you want to talk to and do it faster and for free, which is great. You want to create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs? You can do that. That's that. That way you can reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. 810 million. That's a lot of people. And they want jobs. What you do is then you add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. That way you can spread the word that you're hiring. That way your network can help you find the right people to hire. You don't want to waste time with people who aren't worthy or qualified for a job that you've got posted. You know, you don't want to do that. You want, you want the right people and you want them quick. So simple tools they have on LinkedIn, like screening questions, they make it easier to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. We know it's a process. It takes some time. That way, that was why you don't want to waste your time with people who, who are not going to be getting this job anyway. You want the right people. And it's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs will help you find the candidates you want to talk to and do it faster. Did you know that every single week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? I visit LinkedIn at least four days a week because you just never know when that next opportunity is going to pop up. And if you're somebody looking to hire people, make sure you get on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So let's get back to baseball last night. We're in the top of the third inning, and it's 6 nothing. Tyler O'Neill he gets a walk to lead off the inning, and that brings up Albert again. Now, I've been to, I don't know, seven or eight Cardinals games this season, hundreds in my lifetime. Up till now, I've actually only seen Albert Pujols hit maybe two home runs in person. And obviously, that was during the first run when he was uh, with the Cardinals, way back when. Feels like it was forever ago. He's come close multiple times this season at Great American Ballpark, but they either went foul or they ended up dying at the track. So I've been hoping to get to see one. And last night, woo, I got to see one. And it was awesome. Albert 
falls behind 0-2, and then he takes a fastball on the outer corner, and he just kind of, like, not a mighty swing. He just kind of, nice and smooth, hammers it over the wall in right field for a home run. It's number 694 of his career, and not only is it number 694, it also sets a new record for pitchers that he's homered off of in his career. Ross Stettweiler, you're number 450 in the great career of Albert Pujols, which passes Barry Bonds, who had the record at 449. Think about this for a minute. 450 different guys have now given up a long fly to Albert Pujols. Guys like Jeff Bagwell, Vladimir Guerrero, Andre Dawson, Kyle Ripken Jr., Mike Piazza, Duke Snyder, Al Kaline. These guys never even hit 450 home runs combined. And Albert has done it off that many different pitchers. It's incredible. What you're seeing is incredible. And for him to be doing it at age 42, it's nuts. It's mind-blowing. Now, I posted footage of the record-setting home run on our Locked on Cardinals YouTube page. The link is down below in the description of this video if you want to see my, my vantage point of the big fly. And I have to say, I'm going to pat myself on the back here. I'm kind of a good cameraman on this one. I only had one little shaky moment when he went around first base. But other than that, I'm right on that sucker. So uh, check that out. Uh, not the farthest home run of Albert's career. It only goes 369 feet. But all it has to do is clear the wall. And it counts. And it did. What a moment. Eight to nothing. And now I can say I saw the machine make history and also continue on towards more history. Because he's now just two back of Alex Rodriguez for fourth all time. Six away from that magical Number 700, it was also his 21st career home run at Great American Ballpark in his career. Just awesome. Now, at this point, the game could have ended, and I'd have been happy. <laughs> I saw what I wanted to see, and I could have left a happy man. But we roll on to the bottom of the fifth, and Michaelis, he's moving right along, too, until this point. And that's when things go sideways for Miles. Yesterday, I said all the Cardinals pitchers, what they needed to focus on was just keeping the ball in the ballpark. All right, if you saw yesterday's video, I told you, keep it in the park, you'll be fine. That doesn't happen here. T.J. Friedel. Yeah, you're going to love some of these names that you hear uh, this inning. T.J. Friedel works an 11-pitch at bat against Michaelis, and he's teeing off on Miles. Like, they're going all over the place, and they're like rockets. It's almost as if T.J. knew what was coming, like Miles was tipping his pitches or something. Uh, but finally, on the 11th pitch, he rips a slider over the wall in right field, makes it 8-1. to one. Next hitter grounds out, but then Stuart Fairchild. Never heard of him, have you? Gets a hanger on the first pitch to him. He destroys this ball 431 feet into the second deck and left. It's 8-2 to two Cardinals. And the look of disgust on Miles Michaelis's face after, like, as soon as he released it and saw the ball, he just, oh, just head down in shame. He's like, you got to be kidding me. Missed his spot, got torched. It happens. Next hitter walks, and now it's Chucky Robinson's turn. Yeah, another guy you've never heard of. He works an eight-pitch at bat. He ends up catching a sinker up in the zone and unloads for his first career home run in the major leagues, which is another cool moment. I, I find that stuff to be really neat to see somebody hit their first home run in the major leagues, even if it is against the Cardinals. I stood up and, and clapped for Chucky. Uh, but anyway, that makes it eight to four. And Michaelis can't believe this is happening. He's like, what, is, what, what have I done here? Jonathan Indy comes up, he singles, and Ollie's like, I, I can't watch this anymore. Ollie has to go get Miles, has to pull him. He was throwing four shutout innings, moving right along, eight nothing lead, and then he gives up three bombs, four runs in the fifth, and he's done. And that's how quickly things can turn at Great American Ballpark. So I can't really blame Ollie for going to get Miles because uh, you you just you can't just let that continue. I mean, he was clearly in a rut of some sort and just. Psh, so, again, not a great outing for Miles Michaelis. Chris Stratton, damn glad to meet you, comes in. He stomps out the remaining threat. But it's a ball game now. It's 8-4, to four, but luckily the Cardinals, they still get to hit in this game, and uh, they haven't been stopped all night. Top of six, they they answer again. Two on, one out. Arnado rips one to the wall and left for a double. Both runners score. It's 10-4. to four. And then arguably the Cardinals' hottest hitter. Tyler Bronil. Comes up again. First pitch that he sees from Hunter Strickland, who, by the way, I have no idea how he's still in the league. He's he's terrible. He's a terrible pitcher now. Slider, low and in. Bro Neal, booyah, crushes it. Blasts it. It's a no doubt line shot into the stands in left field. It's his second of the game, 12th of the season, 108.5. Exit Velo off the bat. It goes 403, makes it 12 to 4. 
and then everything is kind of chill. <laughs> everything is kind of chill. Uh, we even have another rain delay, and then we go to the ninth inning, and we get ourselves a dick dong, as the Cardinal fans like to call it on social media. Corey Dickerson waxes fifth of the season, albeit off of Alejo Lopez, who is a position player that the Reds brought in to pitch in the final inning, but still counts, and that's how we finish, 13-4 to four good guys. Uh, Cardinals offense, 13 runs, 14 hits, four of those are taters. Michaelis gets chased early, only goes four and a third, four runs, six hits, three of those home runs, but there was no need to um, stretch them out and to keep them going in there. I mean, you had a comfortable lead. You just didn't want to get it that much closer. And give credit to the bullpen, man. They did their job. Stratton, one and two-thirds scoreless. Zach Thompson, we got to see Thompson get in. He looked great. Two innings scoreless. Jake Woodford, one inning of shutout ball. Besides Miles getting stung by the long ball, this was uh, about as dominant. As it gets, uh, it's what the Cardinals should do against inferior talented teams like the Reds down the stretch, who they're going to face a ton. Uh, we've got an update on Jack Flaherty coming up still, but before we get to that, I do want to point out, I want to talk about this outfield, uh, specifically Tyler O'Neill for just a minute. Now, I know, no secret, I'm a big Tyler O'Neill fan. His talents are undeniable. He's a, a two-time Gold Glove Award winner, one of the fastest guys in the league, sprint speed 29.8 feet per second, which is top 10 in the league, tremendous strength and power. Sure, he strikes out a bunch. But in this day and age, you can live with that. In fact, I was talking to some of my buddies uh, who were at the game with me last night, and we were bringing up how good Adam Dunn would have been in this era of baseball. The guy was like clockwork every year. 40 home runs, 100 runs scored, 100 RBIs, tons of walks, a truckload of strikeouts to go along with all of that. But He'd be a superstar in this era. The point is, if, you, if if the strikeouts are what's bothering you about Tyler O'Neill, then he's doing something right. Now, if other things were faltering as well, if he was striking out, playing crap defense, uh, awful base right, if that was happening too, I can understand why you'd be down on Tyler in some way. But I don't know how you can be right now. He's doing a whole lot of right at the plate these days. In his last 30 plate appearances, he's hitting 304 with five home runs and 12 RBIs. He's got three home runs in like his last, what, five, six at bats, something like that. He's also walked six times and only struck out four times. That was pretty good for Tyler O'Neill. His OBP 433 over this stretch with an OPS of 1.390. He's slugging it, dude. He is raking. He's crushing. We've said it all season that if he could finally get healthy, because he hasn't been for most of the year, if he could finally get healthy and show us just a glimpse of the guy that we had for most of last year when he garnered some MVP votes in the National League, that this team would be dangerous, absolutely dangerous offensively. And that's what's happening, man, because you've got Goldie and Arenado doing what they're doing. You've got a red-hot Albert Pujols. Now you're you're putting in Tyler O'Neill, who's on fire. Other outfielders obviously contributing. Shout out to Newt Bar. Newbar continues to impress every day with his ability to get on base at the top of the order against the right-handers uh, over his last 15 games, hitting 283, which isn't amazing, but it's really good. But his OBP is what I want to point out, 441. He's had 15 hits during this stretch and 14 walks. Like, he works the top of the zone, and he works just when he's the, he's the leadoff guy. He's just working these pitchers to death. He makes them throw strikes, and he's not afraid – to take the walk, which I love. You know this about me. I love a guy who, who doesn't get impatient at the plate and makes the pitcher come to him. So, Newt doing his thing. Corey Dickerson. Corey Dickerson had three more hits last night. He's now hitting 283 on the season. His last 29 at-bats, he's hitting 552. 552. And because of this, where is Dylan Carlson? Whom the Cardinals did not want to trade for Juan Soto. I know I had to bring it up again because I still find it hard to believe that Carlson was the key point there that they didn't want to move him. That's what didn't get them one soda, but that's all right. I digress. We've moved on from this, but I mean, Carlson has basically been relegated to a platoon player who only hits against, le against left-handers and he's been outstanding against the lefties. He really has 324 this season, but stinky PU garbage from the left side of the plate again, or hitting from um, yeah, against the righties from the left side of the plate. Just 210. 210. That's not going to get it done. And as good as he is defensively in center field, you can't deny what Dickerson and Newpar are doing at the plate. So Carlson has essentially lost his everyday job because he cannot hit right-handers. He's just not good at it this year for some reason. 
Um, they bring him in as a defensive replacement from time to time. They can do that. But I don't think it's such a bad thing that Carlson isn't playing every day. And here's why. Let me tell you why. Personally, I think it's really cool that Ali has got these guys that he can mix and match for whomever is on the mound that day. It gets a lot of guys some extra rest because against the lefties, who the Cardinals have destroyed this year, he's had O'Neill in left, Carlson in center, Newt Barr in right. Although he struggles against lefties, he just loves having Newt and his energy good defensively in right field, so there was no reason to take him out. Against the righties, he's been using, using a combination of Dickerson in left, O'Neill in center, Newt Barr in right, or you can put Donovan in there. He's been outstanding against righties as well. He's hit 301 against them this year. On the infield, he's moving around Edmund, Gorman, DeYoung, Donovan. Gives days off from the field to Arenado and Goldie. Lets them DH. Albert gets to DH a lot. And obviously, he played first uh, last night. So he sprinkles in Albert at first base from time to time to give him some action. Ali is mixing and matching so well. So well right now. And let's not forget, too. Ali Mormal is a rookie manager in Major League Baseball this year. He's a freaking rookie. Now, it might bother some guys that they don't get to play each and every day, no matter what, because, you know, that's how old school managers do it. It's just same lineup every day, put it out there. But Ali's working with these different lineups against different pitchers, and you got to admit it's working. The Cardinals are winning. They're now 21 and six in the month of August and 23 and seven in their last 30 games, which is second in all of major league baseball, only to the Dodgers who are 24 and six. And we all know how good the Dodgers are. So I just kind of wanted to point that out really quick, really proud of uh, the job that Ollie's doing mixing and matching the people. Now, um, Here's another positive thing. Cardinals could be getting Jack Flaherty back here real, real soon. Jack threw for Triple A Memphis on Friday, and it went okay for the most part. He allowed a run on four hits and three walks while striking out three over five and a third. The walks, obviously, that's going to be a problem. That bothers me a lot. He had command issues. He threw a couple of wild pitches, too. But he did get his first win of uh, the four rehab starts that he's made so far. Uh, partly because of a roster crunch and partly because they want to make sure Flaherty is ready to pitch at the major league level. They're winning without him. No need to force him right now. So his next outing will not be with the big club. It'll, in fact, be on Wednesday with AA Springfield. But he'll be full go, according to Ollie. No pitch count. There'll be no limits. And barring any setbacks, they are targeting September 5th, which is a home date against the Washington Nationals for his return to the Cardinals, which is nice because the Washington Nationals are not very good at baseball. So why not? <laughs> in his first start, put him up against somebody who, you know, he has a, a good chance of succeeding against. Now, tonight, it will be Dakota Hudson on the mound for the Cardinals against the Reds, who counter with right-hander Justin Dunn. Hudson won and won against the Reds this year, but he pitched well his last time out against Chicago, which earned him this start tonight. Uh, Dunn has never faced the Cardinals. He is one and two on the year. He's got an ERA over five, but it's a little misleading. He hasn't been on the team all year, and he has been terrible. But uh, I would expect the lefty heavy lineup again tonight, slim, similar to uh, last night's lineup. But maybe you see Gorman get a start tonight. Possibility. I mean, why not? Um, I would like to see Nolan in the lineup tonight. If it's another right-hander, why not get Gorman's more at-bats? Uh, first pitch, though, scheduled for 540 St. Louis time. Once again, I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Cardinals your first listen. Now make your second listen, the Locked On MLB podcast, MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan. He's bringing the humor, the passion, and unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Last night when I got home uh, from the ball game, Sully was uh, he was live doing his thing, talking about the Yankees and Alex Rodriguez and getting in arguments with people. He's got a fun uh, podcast there. So follow the number one daily league-wide podcast, Locked On MLB on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. As always, be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Follow on Twitter at LO underscore Cardinals and at JD Sports Radio on Twitter as well. You're the best fans in baseball for a reason. I'll see you next time on Locked on Cardinals.